But, but there's an example, too, of invention. But this guy invented the glue that holds plywood together. You know, you put it cross grain. And uh, it was a great achievement because all the previous glues stank. I mean, plywood was still strong, but you couldn't stand to get near it. And he invented an odorless glue and became terribly wealthy. I made my novitiate. I was studying to be religious once. Made my novitiate in a mansion up in uh, Vermont from a man who invented the, the uh, bottle cap. Um, I mean, that's pretty humble. But he had nine mansions around the world. And yeah, you can say there's a monopoly. It's right. Every invention is an instant monopoly. And the beauty of the Copyright Act is that it provide, makes you state exactly what's new about you and allows everybody else to invent something close to it but not infringing on it and bring in um, a competition. So I disagree with you. I think many, many of the great, all the great, all the small businesses I know of are brought about by people who have a new way of doing things. They deliver an old service better or in a new way. There's always an angle to it. That's the enterprise part and I think that's where the wealth comes from. Thank you, Professor Novak. Now I would like to invite Dr. Clark again to ask one or two questions, but this time to Mr. Stork, who I uh, call to the podium. Okay, Mr. Stork, uh, you did a nice job uh, in critiquing capitalism, so I'd like to applaud you on that. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't disagree with the materialism inherent in socialism. Uh, you know, this is a severe problem. I work with uh, groups in Ireland, and one of the things they complain about Sweden is that nobody volunteers for anything, and that lessens the community. So uh, no, I, 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 I see that that's a, that is a serious uh, limitation. Uh, the question I have for you, uh, most of my work in economics is dealing with the, pro the world as it is, actual problems, and trying to move in a direction. Uh, and if you can give two or three actions, given our economy as it is now, with its legal structure and property ownership and all that, that would move us in the direction of uh, a more distributionist model. Well, if you mean one of the things you said, I think just now, one of the stipulations you made was given that we keep the legal system the same, is that correct? Well, you can change it, but it has to be through the normal yeah, democratic, democratic means. process, right. Well, there's a lot, as I uh, hinted, there's a lot that one can do to promote distributism even now. There's a lot that can be creatively done, and I am, there are people who can speak to the practical question more effectively than I, but there's a lot that can be done with farmers' markets, encouragement of local businesses, forming of cooperatives, and things like that. Uh, starting of, of worker businesses, but to I will admit that if you're going to have a full-scale distributed society, as as Lawyer Bellock sketched it in the um, restoration of property, you do need changes in the legal system and you do need state action. And as you may be aware, a a tax favorable tax treatment to small businesses was one of, was one of the keys to Bellock's plan for the establishment of distributism. And Ultimately, that would have to be done. Obviously, the population would have to be convinced first that distributism was wise and just because it's not going to be imposed by a dictator. But given that there was a change of heart and a change of mind on the part of the, of the American people, there was no reason why the kind of favorable tax treatment for uh, small businesses that Bill sketched, which would have and, and could effectively make break up large businesses and you, you may be aware that in the 1930s, during that extremely interesting, fertile time of economic ideas of the New Deal and the late Depression, there were, Congre Congress held hearings about chain stores, and a number of states passed laws that would have uh, eliminated chain stores in favor of small, single proprietorships, mom and pop stores. But these were uh, eventually all either repealed or struck down. I'm not sure of the history of all of them, but there were, Congress held hearings on, on chain stores. So this is not something that is simply some theoretical idea that has never been attempted or never been implemented. And of course, if you go back far enough, in the medieval urban economies, you do have a distributist order uh, kept in place by the guilds that was quite effective. It wasn't perfect, but it was quite effective for hundreds of years. Okay. Do you see 
where, where I would attack, and I'd like your thoughts on, on this, I mean, if you look at how the economy structured the legal system uh, and, and how the government tax and spends, uh, there's the impression that we, we're subsidizing the poor, but actually we subsidize the rich to a much greater extent. And one of the greatest subsidizations we have is limited liability. Now, do you see that as being part of changing the rules to allow for smaller firms and, as opposed to larger ones? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, it's amazing if, if you know the history of corporations in the United States. Before approximately the Civil War, each corporation had to be chartered by a state legislature in a separate piece of legislation. This charter uh, in, included in the legislation would stipulate how much money the corporation could raise, what kind, of cap, what kind of capital they could have, where they could do business, and sometimes it would put a sunset provision in saying the corporation can exist for X number of years and then either has to dissolve or apply for a new charter. Beginning after the Civil War, approximately, both through Supreme Court decisions and legislation, states began opting for general incorporation laws, and the Supreme Court, in a very questionable uh, decision in, in the case of Santa Clara Railroad uh, declared corporations as to be persons according to the uh, 15th, 14th Amendment. Uh, corporations began to, be, to take on all the rights, or almost all the rights, of human persons and not all the liabilities of human persons. And this is, a, this is an artificial, totally artificial construct. The notion that corporations are somehow a naturally existing thing is ridiculous. If, we could change the behavior of corporations overnight if we got rid of the limited liability laws. If we said, if you pollute, for example, if you pollute, the uh, heads of the corporation would go to jail, the corporation would change its behavior pretty quick. <laughs> but now, the corporation might be uh, financially hurt by a lawsuit, say, but the, usually the uh, directors and so on and stockholders can go away. If stockholders were responsible, say, up to the limit of their investment for corporate misdeeds, stockholders would be, show up for the annual meeting, they would vote in those proxy votes, they would be sure that they were controlling the corporation as much as possible. So yeah, uh, that whole movement to give corp of corporate um, empowerment, I don't like that word, but I can't think of another one on the spur of the moment, of corporate empowerment that occurred after the Civil War was an amazing power grab by big business and nowadays, most people aren't even aware that there's an alternative to the uh, corporate model that we have now. Well, it goes to the importance of how you structure markets and assign rights. Uh, and the last question I'll ask you is, uh, if you were advising the president uh, on the current financial crisis, in terms of the financial aspect of the crisis, uh, what, what insights would distribution, uh, distributionism bring that are not, is not brought up elsewhere. Well, these insights, or not insights, these, these um, prescri policy prescriptions that I'm would, would about to make are not necessarily limited to distributism. I'd say they're limited to anybody who looks at an economy without blinders on. When you have banks, for example, who have all kinds of what we call toxic assets that they either can't unload or can't unload at a price they're willing to take, and the government comes along and says, oh, we'll buy them. Just tell me the price. We'll pay you the money for it. And uh, that's a completely ridiculous uh, way to go. The, uh, if we're going to have a, if we're going to try to keep up our capitalist facade, then they should tell the banks, well, you want to sell these assets or sell them for what the market will give you for them. If we're going to just do something more radical, then as Pius XI said, the banking, the banking system, there's actually uh, in Catholic social thought, you can find quite a bit of support for nationalizing the banking system, or at least putting it under severe government control, because he said it, it's the lifeblood of the economy, is what Pius XI said, and people are afraid to breathe against his will. Those are quotations from uh, Quadrismo Anno. And so the economy, when you talk, if the end of the economy is the common good, then you have to ask yourself the question, as long as you're not violating Catholic teaching, as long as you're not violating any, any of the genuine uh, human rights, what is the most efficient and productive way of orienting ending an economy toward the common good? Generally, it involves widespread ownership of property. In a few cases, as Pius XI explicitly noted, it involves government ownership, not as a rule, but...